You've been in the school for quite some time. You've been training students. In terms of skills, in terms of knowledge. But all the same, this has not been stopping them. They just want to go there and have one or two things that they will do. They get more money. So, one of the challenges we have is because of the personal drive to achieve more. And you cannot compete with that. The person's personal drive to achieve more. Regardless of whatever environment you provide. You are here in Nigeria and then you can get outside Nigeria to see what it looks like. When you come back, you want to you want to put that in practice and then you have opportunity. In that regard, we we'll move forward because time is not on our side. Uh, for our moderator for the panel of discussion, we have our able Vice President, in person of Mr. Adeyeni Abdulatif. He's our moderator for the panel of discussion. Please, can we clap for him? Mr. Adeyeni Abdulatif, born nearly six decades ago to Prince and Princess Bello Akanji Adeyeni from Ileife, began his journey in a humble background. He completed his primary and secondary education in Ileife, qualified as a registered nurse in 1991 and as a perioperative nurse in 1994. He earned a BSc in Health Education from Lagos State University in 2000, followed by a BNSC in 2016 and a Master's of Nursing Sciences in 2019 from Bakko University, Malaysia, Remu, Remu Ogun State. Pardon me, please. Ms. Aydeni has participated in num numerous seminars, conferences, and workshops in nursing. He has contributed significantly to the field through various research projects, five of which have been published in international journals. His nursing career began at the Obafemi Awolowo University Teaching Hospital Complex, Ileife, where he advanced to the rank of Deputy Director of Nursing Services and is currently a theatre manager. He has also held several leaders, leadership positions, including serving as the National Chairman of the National Association of Perioperative Nurses and currently as the chairman of the Senior Staff Association and State Secretary of the Trade Union Congress of Ogun State Council. Adeyeni is the chairman of the Operating Room Global Nigeria chapter. He is married and blessed with beautiful and handsome children. Please can we once more welcome Mr. Adeyeni. Our first panelist to come to the high table is no other than Mrs. Sekia Temitofe. Sekai. Sekai. Sekai Temitofe. Thank you. Please, can we clap for her? We can clap better, please. Yeah, we can see her smiling <laughs> sorry please mrs mrs temi tope is a distinguished nurse and educator currently serving as the deputy director of nursing clinical and research at lagos state university teaching hospital ikeja with over three decades of experience in healthcare sector, she has significantly contributed to nursing practice and education in Nigeria. Her educational background includes a Master of Sciences in Nursing, specializing in adult health nursing, obtained from Babco University between 2016 and 2019. She also earned a Bachelor of Nursing, a bachelor of nursing Science from the same institution from 2013 to 2016, where she was actively involved in the Sigma Tata Tor Honor Society. 
Additionally, she holds an MSc in Public Health from the University of Lagos, completed in 2022, and a certification in health education from the same university, completed in 2006. Her professional achievements and further highlighting by her fellowship with the West African College of Nursing and in June 2023. Professionally, Mrs. Tomitope has dedicated her career to LASU, where she has been serving as a nurse administrator since June 1991. Her role has evolved over the years, leading to a current position as Deputy Director of Nursing, Clinical and Research. Please, once again, can we welcome our beautiful and able Deputy Director. Our next panelist to come to the high table is no other than Mrs. Defari Mary Titilope. Can you pardon me? Please, can you pardon me with the pronunciation? Mrs. Bifari Titilope. Sorry, no. Okay. Bifari, Mary Titilope, I hope I'm right. <laughs> Mary Titilope Bifari is a highly experienced registered nurse, registered midwife, and registered perioperative nurse with bachelor's degree in nursing. As the director of nursing at Obafemi Awolo University Teaching Hospital Complex, Ileife, she has dedicated over 21 years to overseeing continuing professional development initiative. Bifari has extensive experience in curriculum development, nursing management, and leadership. Her passion for knowledge acquisition is evident throughout her career, particularly in cardiothoracic and oncology nursing. Since 2013, she has been a visiting lecturer at the University of Perioperative Nursing, where she teaches various She has collaborated on numerous projects and initiatives focused on evidence-based practice in nursing. Recently, she has, cleared com she has chaired committees aimed at enhancing clinical governance by consolidating existing frameworks to ensure nursing practitioners are accountable for continuous and care improvement. She also works to foster a clinical environment that deconstruct blame culture. She is an active member of Sigma Theta Tau International, the National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives, the Nigerian Association of Perioperative Nursing, and the Senior Staff Association. Please, once more, can we welcome our able and intelligent hmm, The next to come to the high table is no other than Dr. Nibiu. Doctor, please, the second name. I don't want to mother that name, please. Dr. Nibiu Beliangi. Okay, thank you. Dr. Beliangi is not here. So the next on the high table to welcome is no other than Mrs. Olakpeju Olamiriwa. And Mrs. Olakweju Olamiwa happened to be my, my lecturer at the School of Perioperative Nursing, UCH Ibada. Please, can, can we clap some more? Mrs. Olakweju Olamiwa, born over five decades ago to the family of Prince Joe. Oyanire Olaoye and late Mrs. Elizabeth Atoke Olaoye in Ogomosho land, Oyo State. She had an extensive and illustrious career in nursing. She attended Baptist High School, Ejibo, and subsequently obtained multiple diplomas and degrees, including a diploma in, in nursing, diploma in midwifery, diploma in perioperative nursing, 
and a Bachelor of Nursing from University of Ibadan. Her pursuit for, of academic excellence continued with a postgraduate diploma in education, a master's in medical sociology, a master's in nursing from Bakor University, and she is currently a PhD candidate in nursing at Bakor University. Additionally, she completed a leadership course in health management at the University of Washington in 2018. Olafeju joined the University College Hospital in 1996 as a staff nurse and rose to the position of Deputy Director of Nursing, Training and Education. She serves as the Oyo State NCPDP State Facilitator and Chairman, appointed by the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria. Her roles include being a committee member of the Oyo State Nursing and Midwifery Council, an examiner for the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria, and a perioperative nursing school examiner. Her professional affiliations include membership in National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives, National Association of Perioperative Nurses of Nigeria, She's also a member of GNAN, CBGCA, APROD, EPID, and NIT. Olafeju has been recognized with several awards, including Best Behaved Student in Form 5, in Form 5 during her secondary school days, Best Worker of the Perioperative Nursing School in 2007, and Awards of Excellence from the Association of Perioperative Nursing Students at UCH, Ibadan. She has contributed to the field through various research papers published in local and international journals. Olefeju's hobbies include singing, reading, writing, and attending workshops and retreats. She is known for her commitment to peace, joy, and honesty. With that, please, can we once more welcome Mrs. Olefeju. The last two Adekule. Please, can we clap some more? Please, we can do better. Please, Ogun Usi Joshua Adekule, a native of Ileife in Oshun State, Nigeria, has a distinguished career in nursing and education. Born 57 years ago, he pursued his nursing education at the School of Nursing in Ilori, Kwara State, from 1986 to 1989. His committed to furthering the expertise led him to the College of Education in Akoka, Lagos, where he became a certified nurse tutor between 1995 and 1997. He specialized in perioperative nursing at the School of Post Basic perioperative nursing in between 2002 and 2004. Priest Ogunwisi further advanced his education by earning a degree in nursing from the National Open University of Nigeria between 2006 and 2012. He also holds a master in public health from Ladoke Akintola University of Gomosho. His professional journey includes significant roles at the Seven Days Adventist Hospital in Ileife. He worked as a clinician from 1992 to 1995 and later as a nurse tutor from 1999 to 2001. He joined Obafemi Awolowa University Teaching Hospital in Ileife as a nurse tutor. His leadership skills and dedication were recognized where he became the school in 2012, a position he continues to hold. Priest Ogunwusi is married and blessed with beautiful and handsome children. Once again, sir, you are welcome to the high table. With that, our panel of discussion are well seated and we move straight to the main event of the day. Good morning. Good morning, uh, our, our guests and all participants. We are here to start a panel of discussion, and I have the panelists here with me. 
to start the first to start the session. To start the session here is going to be Mrs. Shikai, Deputy Director, Nursing Clinical and Research from the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital. Ma, as a nurse administrator, what are the specific challenges you have observed in healthcare provider re retention in your experience within African healthcare setting? Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, in public facility like last suit, let me use that as an example. The challenges we have retention is 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 all you can in the sense that when you when we employ the nurses into the service. Majority of them just come in to take the employment letter and leave. Especially now, for the past, we are not exaggerating, for the past six or seven years, that has been a trend. By the time they go through orientation, on body, that is when you brought them in, one year, six months, one year, one and a half years, they've resigned. And by the time you ask them, why do you want to resign? What is happening? Don't you like the services? Don't you like this? Don't you like that? They give you list of complaints. Oh, the, the salary is not encouraging. Oh, the, the country is not okay. We want to go out there and explore. So, from my own angle or from my own perception, because of the state of the country, this sort of pushes them out there to explore and get the desired money to, you know, to meet their aspirations. Their aspiration is to have a better working environment. Their aspiration is to get more money because they believe that they are ready the same service and getting paid so little for it. But if they go out there, do the same service, they get more money. So one of the challenges we have is because of their personal drive to achieve more. And you cannot compete with that, the person's personal drive to achieve more. Regardless of whatever environment you provide, because they want to achieve more, they want to go to where they think they can achieve more. They want to achieve, they want to, you know, to fulfill that desire in them to be able to get what they do achieve their goals. So most of them, especially for the past six years or seven years, they believe that going outside the country will help them to achieve their personal goals. Thank you. Thank you. As a retired director of nursing services, can you please share some of example of successful initiative or program that have deliberately effectively retained or you think can retain healthcare professionals within this resource constrained environment. Thank you. And good morning everyone. Yeah, I think um, to be able to retain a nurses or professionals there should be an opportunity for training and retraining. And so if they have that chance, it gets them their skill improved, and then um, again, better in remuneration and um, environment that is conducive. And um, um, use, the, use the mic, ma. I'm using it. It's not, it's not sounding. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The salary, so to say, something has to be done about it. And then, like uh, we have talked now, if people can be exposed to exchange programs everywhere, you are here in Nigeria, and then you can get outside Nigeria to see what it looks like. When you come back, you want to 
you want to put that in practice and then you have opportunity to have people on ground. Generally, I think when we have clean, nice, safe environments for workers, we we'll definitely have improved um, care for our patients. Thanks so much, ma'am. You've been in the school for quite some time. You've been training students. And you, in terms of manpower development, what are the roles? In your own opinion, how can professional development opportunity be tailored to the unique needs of healthcare workers in African hospitals? Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, the special advisor to the governor, Dr. Kunyemi the chief organizer of this program, of protocols observed. Yes, professional development opportunities can be tailored to the unique needs of healthcare workers in can hospitals. This is very, very crucial. This is Africa region, our own region. Whatever is happening all over the world, we must still be interested in how things are supposed to be in our region because we will survive. Conducting need assessments is the first. We want to know what are the need in terms of skills, in terms of knowledge, in terms of specific areas, context-specific challenges. Because what is happening in the federal health institutions are peculiar to federal health institutions. What is happening at the state level what is happening at the local government levels, there are some things that are general and there are some things that are specific. And I want to say that all stakeholders need to carry out a quick need assessment. When we carry out this need assessment, then we are going to contextualize the content and that content is going to show that we are adapting our solution to the environment where they need it most. And at this, we also need adapt training programs, adaptation training programs to address these local health priorities. Assuming there are disease burdens that are you know, known to some areas compared to others, that is their own need and that is what we're going to face at that particular time. And so with that, if it's a problem of resource constraints, we need to push in more resources in terms of manpower and in terms of resources. I want to, I beg your pardon, I discovered one thing lately. Some people are leaving some hospitals in Nigeria to other hospitals in this same Nigeria. So it's not a matter of leaving this country to another country alone. Recently, some people are leaving even viable hospitals to some other hospitals. From Ibadan to Lagos. From Ibadan to Abuja. What's happening? So we need to look into this. And we need what is called using blended learning. This time around, it's not just about, you know, uh, on-site learning, uh, putting pen to paper. Thanks to God and to the North American Council of Nigeria that is benchmarking what is going on in the US, in the UK, in the Canada, in Australia, everywhere. Now, can we do that in Nigeria? Because when we put in the test content, we discover that our area of focus in Nigeria is different from the focus of other, you know, um, overseas countries. And this is affecting some performances this is part of the need assessment. And, um, you know, nothing council felt that. Let's do CBT, computer-based tests. In fact, let it be computer-assessed. And so far, it has come to stay. And we are trying to benchmark and actually meet up with the standard over there so that whatever we are doing, we actually be global. And of course, this is a global program. This is a global program, and that is the reason why we are trying to look into it so that we will not be left behind. Because some people felt left behind. They want to go to where they can actually bridge the theory practice gap. 
so that we that are in school also have to imbibe blended type of learning, combining online, offline, and some training methods to accommodate diverse learning styles and schedules. Sometimes in our class, we even do role play, so that when you role play, you cannot forget what you have done, and in practice, you can actually remember those things. And uh, like when our mama was explaining the other time that we perioperative nurses don't have much to talk to patients, I want to explain a little aspect of pre-visit. We carry out pre-operative visits even before the surgery. You want to know what type of patient is coming. You want to know specific ideas, areas that the patient will need to, we need to know about much about that patient and benefit by the time the patient comes to us. And most importantly, focusing on practical skills, addressing soft skills, and without wasting our time, I want to say that providing continuous learning opportunities in nursing, this is a workshop, a wonderful one. We have seminars, conferences, online courses, and many of us belong to all these areas. So without wasting our time, I want to say encouraging peer-to-peer -peer learning. In education these days, like when I finish drafting my thesis proposal, I have to share with three PhD holders. And of course, even one of them is here, and I'm so grateful to her because her style of correction was so wonderful. Another person brought in another style, and by the time I collected from my supervisor, I discovered that I need various experts' inputs. Some people are looking for these opportunities more. And when they see it in Nigeria and they want to go to school abroad, they can say, let me stay. But when everything is just pen to paper, no peer review, then they may want to go to where it's better. Probably that's where some people are going to Babcock because I want to say I salute my lecturers. At the same time, I appreciate UI because that had been my first university. And I want to know, say that because I'm in Lagos, I know Lagos is not lagging behind. Yeah. Because incorporating technology enhanced learning is what I'm talking about now. Utilizing digital platforms and fostering collaborations. And of whatever you do, as a teacher, as a lecturer, my own is this. You have to evaluate from time to time. So without taking your time, whether formative evaluation or summative evaluation, when you evaluate, you know how far you have gained, you know where to go back again. There are more work to do. The end of a project is the beginning of another one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, huh? You said it all. Um, Mr. Prince Ogunusi, as a trainer, as a nurse administrator, you've been training professionals in nursing. And most of these professionals have been leaving the shore of Nigeria, going abroad to practice their skill. Can you please share your insight? into the impact of ongoing training and professional development program on healthcare worker satisfaction and retention, something that will make them to be satisfied and to be retained in this country. Thank you, my dear brother, Adi Adi and the moderator. And um, I want to say all other protocols duly observed. Um, today, We have all discovered that when you train 20 students in your school, just in the next two or three years, most of them must have left the shore of this nation for a greener pasture. Now, I want to clearly say this, that it is not their fault. It is constitutional. Section 41, subsection 1, of the 1999 Constitution says, and I quote, that it provides for every citizen of this nation that you are entitled to move from one end of this nation to the other without anybody stopping you from doing that. Then, let me say this again. Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone has a right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. And so everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. 
without any hindrance. May I say this, that based on this, if you believe that somewhere is not okay for you, you have the right to move from that station to another one. Even within Lagos, just like my sister had just rightly said, that you can move from Lut to Lasut to General Hospital Ikeja, whichever area that you think people will accept you and you'll be able to perform your job without any hindrance. And let me say this specifically, just like the question put across to me now, that what are my roles as an individual lecturer on how to mentor my students, at least to retain them at the place of their jobs. Let me say this categorically today, and I want to cite an example. Some years back, most of my students that I knew were very, very good. I needed to call them, and let me say, immediately after they finished their course, perioperative nursing program, they absorbed them into OHAC, Obafemi, our university teaching hospital, to work. And I asked to call them, please, join me in the school. You have no problem. If you are here with me, you'll be able to develop at your space, and nobody is going to hinder your growth and development educationally. They said, you are coming. So each time I go to them, Oga, next week, we'll be here. But the next thing I heard about them was that one was in Canada, another one is in UK, another one is in Australia, another, ah, ah. They were just flying like, like aeroplanes. I became disappointed, but there was nothing I could do. And one thing is clear, I needed to call them. I told them that, let me tell you this, um, it is not rosy, it is not that rosy where you are going. They have their own challenges too. And that is one of those things we need to be telling those people that are going. I think my son is there together with the wife. I know what they are facing. It is not that easy. Here in Nigeria, <laughs> you can have your business and at the same time working. Over there, you work tired. I, I, I think my people are here to bear me with witness. If you do not work, you will not be able to get anything over there. When you book, I never offer you sweet, free of charge. So they need, I, I was trying to tell them all this. Now, another uh, step that I had taken so far is to let those people in diaspora to talk to them about what goes on over there. But all the same, this has not been stopping them. They just want to go there and have one or two things that they will do. And I cannot blame them. Here in Nigeria, hmm, insecurity is one of our problems. If you have been dealt with it, one time or the other, you will run away when you have problem. The another thing is, you can't develop the way you want it. Today, in my, I mean, in my, in my facility, is there, I think I needed to write that I wanted to come for this um, program. He said, you will be released, no sponsorship. And that's detailed to some of the people that are here today. So I can't blame them. So we have been trying at our own end to make sure that we retain those that we have trained. But unfortunately for now, we have not been able to have a way out. Thank you so much, sir. Like you have rightly said, that there is freedom of movement from any point of service to another place. There was a particular neurosurgeon trained by my institution. When he came back, he has not spent two years, he said he was going back. And he went back to where they trained him. Probably there are some incentives that the premier university were putting in place that were not being given at the, his primary center. 
able to ensure that whoever we are trained or the professionals are given some incentives to be able to retain them. I want to believe the founder of this uh, and the chief executive of this uh, organization, I think mean she has been, she's still in the country today. Probably she, she won't be able to do much. Our potentialities will have been hindered. We should check inward within the country to see what are the policies. Our regulatory bodies, American Dental Council of Nigeria, and Northern American Council, all of that. What are the policies you are putting in place that are hindering your professionals that you are training? Having said that, let me go to another person, another nurse, another nurse administrator. What are the role? What role do mentorship and leadership support play in the organizational effort to retain healthcare professionals as a as a profession as a administrator in lawsuit? What are the mentorship programs that you are putting in place to ensure that your nurse, your professionals, your surgeons, your nurse anesthetists, your anesthesiologists, your perfectionists, come up, all of them? What are you doing to ensure that they are retained? Thank you so much. I might not be able to talk about the doctors or the or the other professionals, but I'll be able to talk about nursing. You are <laughs> you are an administrator in that hospital. Yes, I'm an administrator. Talk, 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 talk uh, for everybody. I, I will talk for everybody, but I'll be able to talk more about nurses because that's my primary uh, constituency. You know, when you are talking about mentorship and leadership, the role is quite important because it's when you mentor those that are behind you that you'll be able to have the standard that you're supposed to have but as a mentor what standard do you want to achieve first because if you are going to be a mentor you must be somebody that is able to pass down the correct standard of care or services to the person coming behind or your mentee if you don't have anything to offer, that means your mentee has nothing to give. So you yourself as a mentor must be equipped properly so that you'll be able to mentor your mentee. And when you talk about leadership, it has moved from the area that we used to perceive it. We're not talking about strategic transformational leaders that know their honeyons, that have set out objectives I know how to achieve those. So, mentoring and leadership goes by pursue. Because it's when you are a leader and you have everything you need that you will be able to know that what I want to pass down to my mentee is not just about uh, um, head knowledge or theory. Especially when you're talking about nursing. Because nursing as it is, is practical, it is theoretical. Now we are moving to the, to the base of evidence-based, um, what you do now, evidence-based care. You all want to practicalize our theories. We learn about Horem's theory, Bandura's theory. Ah, we are applying it. That is one of the parts of mentorship. Now in last suit, we are trying as much as possible to groom nurses that are sound and seasoned in both theory and practical. That is why we have continuing education program now. And that continuing education program is not just for the elders or the advanced in, in what do you call it, in Keda, but the younger ones. And we've started one thing now. We are charged, I started, we actually started, you know, and department. It's like a pilot study. We have three elderly nurses that we know that are well seasoned that we know that know what they're doing and we have no2s shadowing them like they are the they are mentor mentee the mentors gives feedback the mentee gives feedback we want to try it in that department to see how it works then because we are just thinking about it generally but that is a practical one they were doing like it's like a mini research 
We are particularizing it now. Let's see the effect on those mentees. How far is it going to go? It's like we want to measure. It's not about talk and talk alone now. There will be, we are doing continuous evaluation with the mentee and the mentor. We want to know how that mentor has been able to influence that mentee with evidence. You know, we have this general mentee, okay, you are the world manager, do this way, let your subordinate watch you without evaluation, without anybody measuring how effective you've been. But now that pilot study is on. The mentees know their mentors. The mentors know their mentees. And we are evaluating. We have this um, questionnaire that with a feel. The mentee comes to me at least once a month. How far? What is going on? Like, I want, like a qualitative study. We want to know. It's a mismatch sort of. Let's know what's going on. How are you enjoying? Are you, is there influence? And if, that, if there's influence, is it positive? Then how is it affecting your productivity? And it's not only about those people there. We are now getting you know, information from people around them that knows the mentor and the mentee. As our behavior, now that she's under that mentor, has our behavior changed? You know, our productivity, our services to our clients, has it changed? Is it for better or still status quo? So when you're talking about mentorship and leadership, it has moved from mouth say. We've moved to evidence-based area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we want to talk about the workplace culture. Like uh, in my hospital of recent, there are some individuals, leaders, that they are not the way they are relating to their subordinates is somehow toxic for the retention of the healthcare professionals. That makes them to leave that work environment, toxic work environment. Now, as a retired director of nursing services, ma'am. How can healthcare organization in Africa prioritize and enhance workplace culture to improve healthcare provide healthcare workers retention? Take for instance, in this hall, you have one of the professionals that you train, your institution trained, but the work culture, work culture, workplace culture did not allow such an individual to stay. The person went to a private institution he was given every opportunity to grow. And today, the person has reached the senate of his, his career. How can we improve the work, workplace culture, Ma? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I think this um, has a lot to do with uh, personality. Um, my sister talked about leadership. We have some leaders that are really toxic. And so we have to start from there. Yes, we, we, nurses, uh, I want to be specific now. We don't have to be eating our, our chicken. Yes, our young ones. We talked about um, uh, being a, a role model, um, being um, a mentor. How, how effectively can we discharge our duty? One, we need knowledge. Most of the leaders don't have it enough. They don't have it enough. And so when you are, well, as they are sending the young ones for training, I think the young the, the leaders, the, the, the supposed leaders that will still be there in the next five to six, probably seven years, should always go for retraining. And so when, when we have, if whatever you don't have yourself, you cannot give. And so if you don't have it, you don't know how to do it, how can you now show it to others? Some leaders are bad. And that's why we have our environment not being conducive. And so if uh, we have a good leader, you will see, even with a positive of fun, she or he or she is still trying to see what she can do well. 
and then she's making effort. So I want to appeal to everyone that is seated here. We must be involved in politics. Get involved. If you are not in politics, some things will be difficult for us to, to achieve or to implement. Uh, there's a Yoruba idea that says, oh, Simbe, uh, uh, something like that. If you're not there, you will know how they're sharing it. So you have to be there to have your voice. In most cases, leaders are shying away from talking, you know, when they get to the, to, to, yes, to, to, to the middle of all other professionals and then they are making decisions, and then you are there, you are not talking. When I was in service, there was a case on my hand, and then it was a real big one, it was going to be global. Nurses versus doctors, as usual. But uh, because of our time, I'm going to cut it short. At the end of the day, we were able to resolve it amicably. Why? Because we relate with ourselves. So, professionals, what uh, our sister is doing is just a great job. Can we put our hands together for her? <laughs> Bringing all of us together, letting everyone know that you are important. I am important. We are all important. Our patient is the center. And then we give patient center care. And then from all of that, the environment, the toxicity will reduce. And then we are able to move talk to governments, give up this because uh, lack of equipment, lack of um, uh, things that we are, materials, stuff that we are supposed to use, they are not there. And so all of these dampen people's um, uh, um, morale, and so they are not able to perform maximally. So uh, the representative of the government are here, and I give kudos to uh, 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 Lagos State. Let's Yes, because uh, this data pl digital platform and all of that, if you can get that spread to other, other states, I'm sure we will go places. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huh? Of recent, in one of the departments of the operating room professionals, there is a kind of knowledge gap and professional gap between their department. We have registrars. The senior registrars, they've left the shore of the country. It is in between the consultants and the registrars. Even some of the registrars were living in droves after practicing, after fulfilling their papers to tr travel about abroad. Even when adverts were placed for them to be recruited, they wanted to recruit about 40 of them. How late did we get 10? Because of the policies that have been put in place. Why are they not staying? What are the innovative strategies or incentives that you can do to address this specific need of the healthcare workers for them to be retained? Ma? That is specific incentive or in strategies that can be placed, put in place for these individuals, for doctors, anesthetologists, perfusionists, perioperative nurses, uh, surgical technologists, for them to be retained, for them to think they want to stay and serve their country. Because it is not a thank you that they will put in place for their children at home. Mr. Olamuiwa. The ball is your court, man. Thank you very much, Mr. Medrito. Some innovative strategies and incentives that address the specific needs of healthcare workers in remote and underserved areas in the whole of the country is a big question. Uh, it's first a personal decision to stay or not to stay. But just that, we refuse to be pessimistic. We are still optimistic that there are some ways we are still going to have some people to stay. And I want to say that those people who for now have reasons for staying, 
those people who for now had some things doing, or those that just proudly patriotic. I have an uncle, the father happened to be a VC of the uh, University of Ilori, and uh, because he was born abroad, everybody felt he would be living over there. Uh, the wife was surprised when my uncle said that um, he will only be visiting every year and be coming back. There's a medical doctor I want to have his hospital here, and he even doesn't want to be doing all these primaries of uh, paper part one, part two. He just went for pra general practitioner, started his hospital, opened another annex, and over the years, he's been like that. He just went to the public, private, you know, setting to learn well and establish his own hospital. Though his three children are abroad now. So whenever they maybe have babies and go, he go with his wife. And I know there are some nurses like that. They don't want to stay abroad. They've been there before. They don't want to continue to enslave themselves. They want to just make that money, come back. Some have the love of this country. If you ask me why Dr. Oguyemi is here, I will say he love this, she loves this country. Because when she was dishing out a lot of things in Ibadan at Sigma program in UI, I looked at her, and by the time she was telling us she's been in nursing since the 70s, and can you look at her? Does she look like an oldie? Not at all. And I want to say that I have some handful of nurses like that, that they just choose to stay in this country. Some doctors will just choose to stay in this country. But the context of my question is that, how can we retain them? How are we not going to frustrate them? Because for some people, they are already politi poli at the politi political you know, hem of affairs. For some people, they are already professors. And they have opportunity to just go there to one university over there and come back. For some that are already well to do and everything they want in life they've achieved. But there are some other people they have not gotten there. I'm addressing that, those people who have not gotten there. And who don't want to be frustrated. And who still want to stay in this country. Who still want to believe that we can survive. Because if we don't stay in our hospitals, tradomancy will take over. And a lot of problems, though WHO even welcomed tradomancy of late, but if care is not taken, the actual aspect of dosage and everything that is the problem, investigations and the values that they won't be able to do and interpret, there are some people that will suffer. And what WHO is saying is, we should reduce mortality and morbidity rates. As a result of which, we need to think out of the box. We need to know that all the people that are around, our workplace culture, policy, and everything must be revisited. What kind of incentive can we revive those that are dying? Can we retain some? Can we bring in more innovations? And part of the innovation that I want to bring in is this. Let's make the work more flexible. Because our team leaders, just like our mama said, our team leaders are yet to be very friendly. Do you know that there are some nursing students that we are actually persuading to stay in this profession? Either in school or in the clinical area, you want to remember how those matrons treated you, and you want to treat them the same way. Young doctors treat them the way their old doctors treated them, they are going. Young nurses, you treat them the way we were treated, they will go. Let's start from that aspect. I always say this in my place of work. We leave our houses very early in the morning before dawn sometimes. And at dusk, we are back home. The all of the day we were at work, minimum of eight hours, some 12 hours, those that are doing calls. Now, let me ask you, 
apart from the real biological family, who are your family members? Your workplace is your family too. Except you see that young boy there, that young man there, as your son or your, your, your nephew, and that young nurse there, and you are looking at her, you are remembering your daughter, or you are remembering your niece, or your younger sister or brother, and you are trying to now mentor them the way you will mentor if you were at home if possible, and still maintaining standard and not lowering standard, and making them to see that the love of this work is just what you are trying to look into. How can we still maintain our, our, you know, the center? Our time is fast spent, but I want to say that it starts from each and every one of us. I have to determine that even though I have difficult students, can I cope with them? In fact, there is a phenomenon going on around now that if, for instance, a younger worker happens to know them at the you know, management level, you may even be intimidated as the boss. That the consultant will be afraid of a registrar because that registrar is the son of the younger brother of the Minister of Health. And when work is enormous, you will not know whether it is the consultant that will do the work or the reg. And the reg wants, the consultant wants the reg to do the work because the reg is here to grab what it takes to save life very well and is willing to mentor. And until that reg is available for the consultant, that is when the life of patient will be saved. No matter how many years the consultant work, one day the consultant will lose the stage. They are celebrated bye-bye at 70. Nurses that are at the you know, clinical area or on the federal government work in our you know, university teaching hospitals, we are celebrated off stage at 60. Some of us are on our way out already. We are looking into how can I give back to my, of my, how can I give back of the qualities that I have, of the skills, of the competencies into another person until I have people that I can actually say when I'm going back, I'm not looking back. Some people that handed over to us, handed over to us gladly. When they come back to a setting, whether hospital or schools, they are smiling. They are laughing. They are not shedding tears. We don't want to shed tears by the time we are going out. We want to still look back. And we want to say, well done. We want to, our mentors, I, I'm not saying this. It's not against saying. I have my mentors that when they look back, they will say, well done. Please, I know you are coping. Because you choose to cope, please continue to cope. And can I also have some people that when I'm going out, because I will soon go, they will soon go. She has gone. Who are those people? So to finally, you know, say a few things more about that aspect. The financial incentive. Okay, President Tinubu gave us 25, 25,000 naira at a time. 35. 35. In the worth of it in the market, I want to tell you it is nothing. I am not anti this government, but the rate at which inflation, ordinary blade, yesterday, buy me a blade, 20 naira blade is now 100 naira. Ordinary biscuit of 10, 20 naira. To buy a good biscuit now, you start from 200 and above. In fact, by the time you are buying 500, 1,000 naira, and above. That's when you know if you want to give a child a biscuit. And you now want to translate that to food. The consultant has the stock. But the consultant cannot even eat what he wants to eat again. That nurse, that senior nurse, everybody is looking up onto him or her. But what he normally is supposed to do had been divided into one over four. And whatever is achieving is one over four of what is supposed to achieve. And we have the love of our patient and we still want to give our best. How effective when you check the impact of our work these days. To retain men, let me quickly say that we need to go back to the drawing board. 
We need to give more to the people working. What are they going to do over there? Is it not comparing salaries? When what I'm earning is one over six of what I will earn when I go out there, why should I stay in Nigeria? Now you want me to stay in Nigeria? You don't want to give me one times six of what I'm earning now. Can you give me half of it? Can our government quickly answer the Labour Party? I mean, the Labour um, Cong Cong Labour Union. Can we quickly give them what they are asking for by dividing it just halfway, if possible? Because they are not even ready to give the 50% of what they are asking. That is why the problem is still on. Who wants to go on rampage? Nobody. When the housing allowance is not enough to pay the house rent, when whatever they are earning cannot put, put food on the table for the whole 30 days. Thank you so much, ma'am. I want to say thank that you, thank you, if we stay, thank you, we need more. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You really answered about two or three questions at the same time. You've mentioned about the unique challenges of where health professionals, health care workers, that some of them that will not even eat before they come to work, that some of them that have some family problems, and we still want them to have positive work attitude. As an administrator, as a leader in the hospital, how can a healthcare organization strike a balance between addressing the unique challenges of healthcare workers and maintaining a positive, positive world culture? That is going to be the last question for this panelist because of our time. Um, well, all we are been saying. All we have been seeing since we have been here is these strategies that can be put in place to retain the healthcare workers in the country. And before I answer that question that has been put across to me, um, I want to clearly say today that in Nigeria, I'm not talking about the African countries because some of the questions that have been put across to or centers on African nations. But we are talking about Nigeria as a reference to what my uh, moderator has been asking us questions. Uh, may I tell you today um, that the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria says it, between 2017 and 2021, about 75,000 nurses left the shore of Nigeria for other countries. Not only that, in 2022 alone, 15,000 of our nurses left the shore of Nigeria for greener pastures. And now, if we are talking about that, we will discover that this nation, when it comes to healthcare workers, is in a precarious state. If really you want to believe me, we are in a precarious state. I'm stating it today because I know that even in schools, we have been having it tough. We have been having it tough. As the head of the school, we are, we are training our students. I've always been going to class. I am supposed to be an administrator for that school, but it is not so. I have been going to the class to teach because we have few nurse educators on ground. Now, we are trying to say that um, how can the health organization in Africa practice and ask work place culture to improve health worker retention. All has been said concerning this retention of the nurses and the workplace culture that my moderator has just asked as a question. Or is it not so? 
Now, I want to say something. And I want to cite school as an example. Our culture in the past is that if you are admitted into this school, you will not be given the opportunity to study elsewhere. And we happen to absorb these students this year, about 10 of them. We told them during the interview that we won't give them the opportunity to study elsewhere until they finish their perioperative nursing program. There and then, they continued with the study. Then just one day, I saw these students trooping to my office, about 10 of them. They said, Oga, I said, yes. Hey, Nibi no Nio, that you shouldn't be angry with us. I said, what are you talking about? I said, we have an exam today. We are loud tech. I said, exam, loud tech. Did we not tell you that there is no room for you to go for study elsewhere where you are still here? Full time course. I called my HOD. I said, HOD, this is the problem I have. The HOD said, let them develop themselves. As you no, know, release them, let them go. And I had to call them. That is striking a balance between the culture of wherever you are and the reality on ground. Now, they left for that exam. And the only problem is anytime the exam clashes with our own, we will not allow you. And thank God they have been going and the examinations haven't been clashing. So all I'm saying is we must not to be too rigid when we are training these people because today we don't have enough of this hands on ground and we want these people to move forward. So we must strike a balance between what we have in our institution as law and what is already playing as the truth of the situation. Now, my sister mentioned something the other time concerning retaining these people. <laughs> it, one thing is clear. We must give room for personal development where if really we want these are professions to improve and we want everything to be okay with us. Then the infrastructural facilities in our institutions must be okay. In some of the worlds, I don't want to talk about any institution now. I know what some of the hospitals are facing today in Nigeria. Today, there was a day I entered one of the worlds. I had to see the, the, the roof leaking and they had to be you know removing patients here bringing them here this and that is that a normal thing that is abnormal then when we talk about retaining these people we must talk about the reality on ground that things are not okay with us technologically there is nothing that we can talk about we are still using the thermometer that we had used during the Mongo Park era, we shake it like this. We put underneath the, the armpit of a patient. That is not the best. So those are the things that we need to know. And in 2012, I mean, that just last year, one of my children was admitted into hospital. It was a nasty experience that I had. In one, I won't mention the name of the hospital anyway. In that hospital where my son was admitted, there were no bed sheets. In that hospital, there were no screens. Government hospital for that matter. And to worsen the situation, they said, okay, let us transfer the boy to the, to the May ward. When we got there, we saw fans everywhere, none of them working. And you want me to continue to work in that environment? Prince. May the Lord help us. Amen. Thank us. Thank us. Rounding up, I think to retain professionals is a job for all of us. Both all professionals, the government, and all other stakeholders. Because even if the government gives us one million as the 
minimum wage. If the economic trend, if inflation in the country is not addressed, we will be prey to kidnappers, to all those vices, because professional workers will be prey, will be, will be their target. The security situation within the country needs to be improved. We have to deal with the economic uh, the inflation and to give these HR professionals good working environment. If all these things are done, I think most of our majority of our colleagues, either doctors, surgeons, anesthetists, perioperative nurses, perfusionists, they are patriotic Nigerians. They are patriotic Africans. They want to serve their countries if they have what it takes to, to, to practice their skills. Ladies and gentlemen, our invited guests, the organizers, I want to use this medium to appreciate their panelists from Mrs. Shikai, thank you. Retired DNS, MTB Fanny, I appreciate you. Mrs. Ola Peju, Ola Muiwa, thank you. Prince of the South, Prince Jay Ogusi, I appreciate you. I want to appreciate the organizers for giving us the, the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much. Uh, please, let's clap for them once more.